Meet the Matthewsons. They're a dynasty of dealers. It drives really well. With a love of classics. Ah, it's only condensation. Yeah. In Thornton the Dale, gateway to the North York Moors, they auction over 2,000 rare vehicles every year. 42,000 the ready type, the stunning car. All walks of life, the cars fetch people together. I'm ecstatic. Head of the family, Derek. It's got to be the best job ever, isn't it? We're sort of living a dream. Trusted lieutenants, sons Paul. Not everybody's cup of tea. And Dave. There's Dad's way. And there's Dad's way. <laughs> Keeping them all in check and dealing with the punters, Sarah. Somebody could ring today with some fabulous vehicle that's been sat in a barn for 50 years. You have no clue. It's the chase, it's fine then. So you get up every morning thinking, what am I going to find today? This is a family's love affair with cars that have lived a life. Someone's cherished a car and loved it, and I think it's just great. I think it's absolutely superb. A passion that can be turned into brass. sale this week. 1976 registered AC Cobra Prilgrim bodied. They're good value, they're good fun, they're individual. At least it's still in one piece and it wrapped around a lamp post somewhere, which is always a bonus. Volvo, F88, the Wrecker. Wow, that's different. It's become known as the love truck. Drawing the curtains on a Saturday evening. <laughs> <on> <laughs> oh, come on, no, no. <laughs> Royal Enfield, Constellation. Got it in October 1960. We'd had good times on it. Lovely bike. I just never, ever saw me getting rid of it at all. With every age group, they reminisce. It's, it's what their dad had. My dad drove a maxi. I don't want one. One eight five school. I haven't done that because I don't know much about it. Auction day is approaching. Oh, dear. Go on, what are you looking at, sir? They All love right, it. Okay. They love the pressure. Look at that little face over there. Look at that little bit in his eye. Yeah. Oh, look at it. Yeah. And Derek's in trouble. It's going to be busy, yeah. 200 and odd vehicles. Too many cars. 30% right. more cleaning cars. 30% more paperwork to do. 30% increase in pay. What was that? <laughs> 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 But there's always room for one more, if Derek likes it. It's a good enough looking vehicle to encourage quite a number of people to come on the day, I believe. Those that want something, a bit of a change from an MGB or a midget and such like, for MGB money, really. Alan Terry owns one of the most flamboyant cars in Bradford. It gets a lot of looks when you're driving around. Um, yeah, you've, you've only got to park at the side of the road and everybody's around looking at it. It's an unusual car. It's, uh, so. We have got uh, Pilgrim Sumo, uh, AC Cobra kit car, um, two litre uh, Pinto engine, tuned Deloto carburetors. It's based on a 1976 um, Cortina 2 litre. They used to be very brave to drive them. It's quite easy to lose a back end. You have to keep that in check because it does like to slide about. Alan bought the Cobra five years ago, but he just hasn't had the time to give it the attention it needs. I think you buy them with great intentions and then they finish up in a garage or a barn somewhere and that's, a, that's the last of you see of them. At least it's still in one piece and it wrapped around a lamp post somewhere, which is always a bonus. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> oh, you're right. Yeah, good, thanks. Nice to see you. Oh, that looks nice, doesn't it? It's all right, isn't it? Yeah. Is it your baby then? Aye. How long you had this? I've had it about three or four years, but it just it's never, never really turned a wheel, so. Yeah, I'm a fan of the Pintos. They're getting hard to get now, Pintos, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I did toy with. 
taking it all out and putting a big a rover in lump in it, yeah. But um, mm. I thought, well, it probably turns out as much power as a rover engine anyway, does that? So. Yeah, I bet it sounds nice. It's OK. Yeah. Should you fire up? Yeah, she fires up. Nice. Yeah, give her a start then. Sounds nice, doesn't it? You've got them carbs about right, haven't you? Yeah. Very smart. All right. It's quite a nice broad carb, isn't it, really? It's, um... Yes, they look the part, don't they? Yeah, they do, don't they? Yeah. What we got to do? What sort of reserve do you want? I'm looking, I'm looking to get 11 and a half for it. Mm. Mm. I don't know if it's yeah, sold in it's the ballpark, isn't it? Yeah, it's in the ballpark. Does it drive all right, Alan? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think it's saleable, isn't it? The Cobra was a result of a collaboration between the very British sports car manufacturer, AC, and American race engineer, Carroll Shelby. With a 7-litre engine, it hit 60 in 4 seconds, topped out at 165, and put the frighteners on Ferrari. Less than 1,000 Shelby ACs were produced. All the others are copies, replicas and kits, paying homage to a car that epitomised raw power. You can get a basic Cobra kit car for a few thousand, a really good one for a hundred thousand. But you would need a million pounds to buy an original Carroll Shelby AC Cobra. These are the real thing. These cars are a childhood dream for me. This collection of original AC Aces and a Cobra are owned by professional stunt driver Russ Swift. Once I got my first one, it just snowballed from there. The Cobra is, uh, is the ultimate uh, car that uh, I was looking for. I can remember drawing Cobras in my school exercise books and getting told off by the teacher. They've got the shape, they've got the engine. Just the personality from day one, they were just an animal. They, they are dangerous. They, they are so quick and so light and, and, and so delicately aluminium body and a very flimsy space frame underneath. Uh, anyway, if you do have an accident, isn't, there isn't an awful lot of protection. They used to call him the widow maker. I've met the son of the person who bought it and his mother made him sell it before he killed himself. There's nothing like the rumble of a V8 certainly uh, makes a noise like it's something a bit special. <laughs> it is a real driver's car. Uh, a lot of modern cars, you feel quite isolated from the car, but you know, every little uh, input you put into this car, it, it translates to the road. You've just got to be careful with the power, because if you do give it everything in low gears, you, you'll just swap ends or end up in the scenery somewhere, but uh, it does need to be driven with an awful lot of respect. Some of these replicas are absolutely fantastic and have the same feeling of satisfaction as if you drive it down the street and nobody would know the difference. Lovely. Nice car, good looking motor. Nice thing, nice to see in white for a change. People tend to paint them metallic blues and odd colours and things, and I think it looks nice in white, I think it suits it. This could be a bit of fun and games. Steady on, mate, steady on. Alan's hopeful the auction is the right place to find a buyer for his million-pound look-alike. I would imagine somebody who likes fun motoring. Steady away. It hasn't got the big V8s that some do have, uh, but it's still, it's still got plenty of go in it, so... Definitely a unique thing. Uh, there's not very many of them about. Wow, what a driver. It's a good bit of stock. It's not everyone's cup of tea, obviously. We're all anti, well, I'm not, but a lot of people are anti replicas and, and specials or kits or whatever they want to call them. Uh, whereas years ago, back in the uh, 50s, you know, there was kits galore. I think they're great, I think they're good fun. We've all got to be a little bit odd and extrovert, haven't we, mate? You know, there's no good <laughs> buying, all of us buying Mondeos, is it?
At Matthewson's, the mighty cobra has arrived. The owner is looking for £11,500. It's uh, sensibly priced. A lot of them up in the 17, 18, 20,000. It's not in that league, but then again, it's not that price. I think it's very, very good value for money. Not dressed up very much. Would like nice maybe with a side pipe or perhaps the pipe wants rerouting rather than come from the, uh, from the middle of the vehicle. But other than that, absolutely lovely. I'm, I'm quite pleased with it. I think it'll do extremely well. Replica AC Cobras vary a lot in quality and desirability. Derek's had a cheaper Hawthorne version in for a while. It has never reached its three grand reserve. It's caused very little interest. It's just not quite got the curbside appeal. If it drove past, you wouldn't really think it was anything other than exactly what it is, a replica. I think most people want a proper AC look-alike, but we've given it a chance, and you've got to put your hands up sometimes. It just doesn't work for you. Somebody who knows what works for him... There's some good stuff in here. ..is Aussie collector Paul Simpson. Right-hand drive, good thing in this country. ..who just happens to be passing through thornton le -Dale with his wife, Titch. I could see myself in that every day. <laughs> That's rare. Originally from South Shields, he prides himself on being able to spot a rare classic. That is a fantastic collector's piece. Spin that camera, the little bond over there. That's a collectible car, and it's just laying there in the grass. Shame, actually. But the real reason Paul's here is to show off his V8 replica Cobra. Have a look at the side pipes on this one and the mag wheels. Beautifully finished V8. Five-speed gearbox, independent rear. So it handles very well, drives extremely well. What's the attraction of one of these for you? The noise. sat watching Elvis on the movies when I was a child and you just looked up and thought, hell, one day when I get older, I'm going to be like that and have one of those cars. It's just a, every schoolboy's dream. Serious dealers Mark and Rob have arrived to see the Cobra. I'd always want to look at the history of paperwork just to make sure that, you know, we know what we're buying, really, if we can. People always like to see a, a good history folder. Um, so if you can present them with lots and lots of stuff to go through, again, it shows that the car's been well cared for and uh, had money spent on it. It's a really good shell, isn't it? When it said it was a Cortina running gear, I didn't quite know what to expect, but um, they've done it really well, and the interior's still good, Rob, isn't it? Very nice, yeah. It'd be a great soundtrack going through the, through the lanes. Um, probably not for the faint-hearted, if you're uh, not an experienced driver, maybe, I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah, two big Webbers as well, which is really, really cool. So it's not standard at all, is it? Pretty thing. Quite like to buy this car. Some are built a lot better than others, we know that. So it's not fair to tar them all with the same brush as being, you know, fibreglass specials and things like that. They're properly made bodies. A lot of research and development gone into this body. It's, it's not a tuppenny apeny thing. Um, and I think people are now just starting to realise that they're good value, they're good fun, they're individual, they're not overpriced, and a really pleasant change from the run of the mill sports car. Derek thinks the Cobra will go for around 12,500 in the auction. We'll soon find out the true value of a decent replica. Even at Matthewson's, it's rare to find a vehicle aged over 50 with one careful owner. John Pearson is one of those owners. His Royal Enfield constellation is woven into his own history. Got it in October 1960. It was £304. It uh, wasn't as popular, wasn't the Enfields, as BSAs and Vincents and Triumphs especially. Uh, but it just looked chunky and heavy, you know, and it, it just looked good, and it was a great sound. Twin pipes, 700cc with twin carburetors, which put it a little bit different to all the rest. In fact, at the time it was produced, it was the fastest production bike on test, 150 mile an hour. I only ever got to 100 at once. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> just a slight bend in the road, you threw me in a flash, you know. Oh, God. John's friend, Brian, also bought an Enfield. 
It would be 1962, I think, when we decided to do a, a tour around the UK, mostly all, all around the coastal area. Even got stopped by the police at one point going into, I think it was Edinburgh. All it was was, he said, I just want to congratulate you lads on keeping to 30 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I say Brian being a policeman, he was he was quite strict on things, you know. John and his wife Margaret had three daughters. They did concede to buying a Ford Anglia, but it was the Enfield that was always the sixth member of the family. We'd had good times on it, and I just never ever saw me getting rid of it at all. It was a tough decision, really. Even even the girls said, "Well, you know, it's too big and heavy for you now." You know. And I suppose they were right in a way. Uh, it had just come to that time. John's beloved Royal Enfield is now safely stored at Matthewson's, ready for the auction. And there's already some interested potential buyers. This is Rob Carter and his wife, Carol, on the back of a Royal Enfield Bullet 500, built in Asia only a year ago. These look very, very close to the old Enfield, but electrical-wise and running-wise, they're completely modern. When they cease production, um, they actually transferred the original Redditch tool into India, but they only took the tool in to make the original bullet, which was either a 350 or a 500 single, and they didn't take the tool into India um, for that model, which is a twin cylinder. It's stunning. But it's all, it looks, it looks to me, it, it looks to be all original, there's nothing missing, it's, it's all there. It's lovely. Yeah. It's nice, it is. Rob is one of the organisers of a huge bike event near Hull that attracts 25,000 people. If he doesn't want to buy John's Enfield, he'll certainly be able to find plenty of bikers that will. As the crowds gather in Thornton Le Dale for the auction, it's the day of reckoning for the Cobra. Rob and Mark are here to bid, but they've got a bit distracted by all the memorabilia. Just having a nose. You never know, you can always pick up a bargain, though, in some of this stuff. Just having a little nose if there's anything that catches our eye that I could hang on the wall, maybe, or there's a bit of souvenir memorabilia. There's a mesmerising collection of stuff that most people don't want. Amongst the 200 lots today, there's been a set of jerry cans. <laughs> A fruit machine. 60 pound. Assorted helmets. Oh, you're done. And a pair of vintage bicycle lamps. Are you seeing? Uh, 1976 registered AC Cobra Pilgrim bodied in white. You've seen it up there, I'm sure. There we go. Start me with that. What's that worth? What they are, is it worth 10? Whereabouts? I know it's worth eight. So who's got eight for it? Who's got eight for the Pilgrim? Eight or we'll pass on it, there's no point. Is there 8,000 for the Pilgrim? 8,000 or we'll pass on that. 8,000 are in the doorway, 8,000 pound. 8,000 in the door. 8,000 pound in the door and submitted. 8,000 pound, 8,000 pound. Is there any more? 8,000 pound, worth a lot more. 8,000 pound submitted it provisionally in the doorway. 8,000 pound, are you sure? Provisional 8,000. <laughs> 8,000 pounds to deal and mark but it was three and a half thousand pounds off reserve. Unfortunately, we were the highest bidder, but it was a provisional bid, and we just couldn't get there on the price what the owner wanted for the car. If we can get there, we can put a deal together, but at the minute, we're just a little bit too far apart, but, you know, we'll see how we go. But Mark won't pay more than he thinks it's worth. No deal. Uh, yeah, just a little bit disappointed we didn't get there, but hey. After further negotiation, the new buyers, Billy and his uncle Bruce, it's theirs for £10,000. So what's the plan with the car then? Um, really to put a V8 back in it to increase the value and then we'd probably sell it on again. This sort of car wants a V8 in it. The proper engine. Proper engine, yeah. No uh, problem. We've already got a, an engine lined up for it anyway, that's why we're interested, you know. Just lying about? Just lying about the shop, yeah. Billy and Bruce are hoping the big V8 engine will significantly increase the Cobra's value. We'll find out later if that plan works. In a way,
warehouse not far from the garage, Derek stores some of his own cars. But his favourite vehicle is a truck. Derek loves trucks. It's not because they're big and they're imposing and stuff like that. Uh, it's because they've got some history and character about them. They're a working vehicle. They were built to work and very often worked to death, so the ones that have survived have been the ones that have been very mollycoddled. There's no question about that. This actually came from a company that supplied vehicles to Hartley. A little Bedford's like this, this is a little M-type. These were bought by coal merchants and local delivery firms. It's a 28-horse, 1951. I bought it as a, a, a blue drop side. Paul and myself built the little transporter body on. Lovely engine, very sweet, nice gearbox, and um, yeah, we love it very much. My dad worked on a railway all his life, 44 years, I think, and he ran uh, light wagons, five tonners and such like that, running round uh, Tottenham and Haringey and, and places like that. And I was really lucky in as much as my dad used to um, take me out all school holidays. And I used to get 10 bob a week and, uh, from my dad. But of course, at that time, I always thought it was from the railway, but of course, it was from my dad. And I actually was, was probably worth my weight, really, because at Paddington Station, you went over a weigh bridge and you got weighed and you got a bit of bonus on the weight that you picked up. So, because I was in there and I was a fat lad, so I probably earned him his 10 bob a week by sitting in the cab or hiding in the cab and being weighed over the weigh bridge. It's fairly obvious that if you're going to spend a large part of your early life in a particular vehicle or in a particular situation or a particular location, you're going to have a fondness for one of those. When I jump in this wagon, this just smells just like jumping into an old 1938 Austin, whatever it was you were using then. When it, when it pulls away, it just sounds the same, so it just takes you right back there. Young Charlie loves it. He thinks it's absolutely great, so there's no doubt about it. He'll wind up with it um, when he gets a little older, I'm sure. So we're just waiting for um, Tom to arrive with his delivery of trucks. Yeah, he's an old contact, Tom Scott from Ireland. Yeah, lovely guys, Tom, we like him very much. We've dealt with him for years. The trucks in question are a 1966 Atkinson tractor unit and a 1970 Volvo F88. Combined value, nearly 40 grand. What did for? I ain't got a clue. Wow, that's different. The Atkinson more than pulled its weight at a time when international haulage was rapidly expanding. It's a nice unit. They're popular, those. While the Volvo brought the principle of a tilting cab to Europe. I didn't realise the Volvo was a breakdown. I thought it was a tractor unit. But she's a uh, full-blown recovery by the looks of her. Safe, comfortable and reliable. The idea of driver appeal was born. Yeah, I like them. I like them very much, yeah. Gardner 150 in that, um, that Atkinson. That'd be absolutely sweet. Sweeter than that. Yeah. You wouldn't get any more on there, would you? Very full. Very good. Is the, is the Atkinson a runner? Yeah, they're all runners. Oh, good. Paul is also pleased with the heavy-duty delivery. I think they're great. I love uh, uh, HGVs and things. I think they're brilliant. You imagine the stories to be told from some of these lorries, especially these recovery lorries. Uh, I think they're, they're fabulous, yeah. They're just maybe a bit big for our side. <laughs> but that's the least of their problems. The Atkinson is about to chalk up yet another story. The 30-ton truck has pranged a Porsche and a Jag. But the heir to Derek's throne is safe. Everybody all right? Yeah, yeah, we're all right. Just caught the front of this Porsche a little bit. I think uh, all's well at the moment. No, you wouldn't want to spend a day in it, would you? You've got a bit of a starter issue. After being quite keen to get off the trailer, the mighty Atkinson is now refusing to fire up for Dave. Was there air leaking earlier? Yeah, there was so. an air leak, yeah. 
the, 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 we're assuming that there's a dead spot on the starter. Is there a, a knack with these uh, with these old trucks? Oh, you just jump going? in, turn it on, cross your fingers, and hope for the best, really. Yeah. <laughs> and if it goes, it's a bonus. The brothers need to work out the problem. A non-runner can mean lower bids in the auction and less commission. A quick scan around the Matthewson garage will tell you that the place is rammed to the gunnels in weird car-related memorabilia. So I've just had a call from Perry, just to make sure we're here today. Like we're not going to be. He's going to pop down with some enamel signs and some goodies. He usually comes with a, a nice van full of all sorts. Like a latter-day step-toe son, Perry and his more senior but trusty helper, Alan, deliver bizarre artefacts for the auction every month. I do like a good rummage through Perry's box. Oh, is it full of the Honda part? Yeah, Can you full manage, of, Alan? Yeah, no, full of Honda part. Oh, always a strong lad, isn't he? Perry, just pull your pants up, mate. There's hundreds of bits in there. Got yourself a classic car? Why not fill it with oil from its own era? Early 1960s, that'll be. It's just made of minerals, you just don't get the same oil now. That's because it's like a treacly colour, look at you. It's yesterday's, isn't it? It's what they used to love what they still do. They love them so much, each one is likely to fetch £75 in auction. Derek will see you love them. All right, Derek, hey. Derek loves Perry. Yeah, they're like peas in a pod, them two, aren't they? <laughs> they like each other because they, they pat each other on the back as to how much rubbish each of them earns. On this visit, Perry has also brought assorted parts for a Honda monkey bike, some toy cars, and some thermometers. Ooh. Look at this. Oh, look, there's your little oh, okay. FM dial there. Tune it in. So who might buy a vintage Rolls-Royce um, FM AM radio? Somebody that's um, probably not quite right in the head. The message is... You'll never predict what Perry's going to bring in next. A day before it goes to auction and the rare Volvo F88 recovery truck has now been joined in the village car park by a comma tipper from 1970. They tend to come around here just because it's quieter, that's all. And you can get some better shots. Even the Atkinson is playing ball after a bit of fettling take a, as many photographs as you can, and we try to, because it does tend to save an awful lot of phone calls. Because a photograph can say a thousand words, can't it? Set off in third. The Atkinson has a lot of torque, but it's not easy to drive. The gears are all over the place. And you knew you were driving a lot. You've been out in this all day. And at the end of the day, somehow you've got to try and keep in here. They used to put a board across if they were staying out for the night and just sleep on the board. Yeah, no curtains, no night heater, no nothing. Yeah. Dealers Tony and Clive are huge fans of vintage trucks. They're particularly excited by this one's engine. That's a 150 Gardener. The Atkinson brothers began making steam wagons in Preston, Lancashire, during the First World War. But when road haulage was nationalised in 1948, the government bought plenty of the lorries. One of the main reasons was the ultra-reliable, war-proven Gardener engine. And as well as their lorries, it powered Bentleys, buses and submarines. In the 1970s, Atkinson merged with Sedans of Oldham. They hauled and delivered on British roads for the next 40 years, until the brand was discontinued in 2009.
Prospective buyer Clive started driving Atkinsons when he was 21. Me and another guy shared it. Not this particular vehicle, but one identical to this. He drove nights, I drove days, and then vice versa. 70,000 a year for lots of years. <laughs> million miles, do you think? Oh, easily. Yeah, easily. <laughs> easily, yeah. It's lovely to see one. It's the first, particularly in the same colour. Takes you back. Takes us back, yeah. Takes us back. So with every age group, they reminisce. It's, it's what their dad had, or it's what the granddad had, or it's what they drove 40 years ago. They just want to reminisce. Um, my dad drove a Maxi. I don't want one. I don't want to buy a Maxi. Who does? Paul's son Charlie may only be 11, but he puts in a fair number of hours at the garage. And occasionally, he needs a reward. Right, Charlie, these came in this morning. Oh. I don't know what they are. They're just racing go-karts, proper things, pucker things, apparently, with lots and lots of spares, as you can see. You all right there? Yeah. So we'll let her down like this, steady away. You OK? Yeah. You got it? Right, let's have her out then. Now then, how's that? What about that then? That'll do you, won't it? <laughs> yeah. The carts are intended for the auction, but Derek's thinking he might get them for Charlie to right. race. This hasn't been discussed with his parents. Whoa, don't forget the brake. Run over my foot. All right, good lad. Come down and go round again. Brilliant. Love it. Oh, I love it. Yeah, go on then. The Matthewsons are a racing family. Derek has always taken a keen interest in vintage motorsport, and sons Dave and Paul have rallied cars for many years. Oh, I think my racing days are over, but these are just starting, and I think it's absolutely fantastic. Keep her going, boy. Give her a bit. He looks at home, doesn't he, with it? He's, <laughs> he's good. He really is good. He's not scared of much, is he? He'll have a go at most things. Oh, my word. Oh, he's racing now. Fantastic. Brilliant fun. It's what kids and these sort of things are all about. It's what they need to do. Charlie's mum has arrived to drive him home for tea. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Get out now, Charlie. Brakes good, aren't they? Yeah. Come on, you've got to get your sister. Well, I can see what you're going to be doing some Sundays. It's the day of the auction and the moment of truth for the 1970 Volvo F88. What I like about this, it's just, it makes me laugh when you rev it like that and a load of black smoke comes out after it. Also going under the hammer, the 66 Atkinson tractor unit. On the steering column, it has an air brake. You pull that down to do the trailer brakes. And that's just for the trailer brakes. Charlie has swatted up. It's been fitted with a taco so that it can tow a trailer. It's a nice truck all in all. I actually quite like it and so does my granddad. Not as good as that Volvo though. Fairly original Volvo, one of the first of the new generation Volvos to sort of come into the UK. Very rare, in basically in running order, and quite collectible. Are you really keen to get this one? If it's the right price, we might just buy it. There's plenty of love for the Volvo. It was used for demonstration purposes to the British Army, brought it over to England and put this truck through its paces. And from there onwards, they bought a couple of hundred trucks. Haulier John Statham knows all about this truck because he used to own it. I worked for a family business, car and truck recovery. I used to drive this when I was a very, very young man. Mm -hmm. I used to go around to, and pick Samantha up in it when we used to go out courting at night. <laughs> we, couldn't, we didn't have a lot of time together, did we? So you used to come to work with me, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, so, occasionally. I've got a lot, a lot of um, history to it. 
the enamel garage sign which Charlie's got there now. Sales start strongly in the memorabilia section. 160 on its way, 160 last time looking round. Thank you very much. Pre-war dinky saloon cars. How many in your collection? Probably about 1,200. And where do you keep them? Or should I say, where are you allowed to keep them? Um, I've got a loft conversion and a spare bedroom. 130. We've picked up uh, a Michelin enamel sign. Norton sign? I've always liked Norton motorbikes, and that's the nearest to a Norton motorbike I can afford. <laughs> <laughs> Nineteen sixty-six Atkinson tractor unit. There she is, lovely thing, runs lovely, starts beautifully, sounds superb. Start me on that, where are we gonna be? Eight thousand, eight thousand five, eight thousand five, nine thousand, nine thousand pounds, nine thousand pounds for the Atkinson, nine thousand pounds, nine thousand pounds. 9,000 pound for the first, provisional only. 9,000 second, third and last time. 9,000, but we'll always talk. 4,000 off reserve. Volvo, F88, the wrecker. Got a bit on me books, got some interest from people supposedly coming. There we go. What do you need? Start it low. 15, 16, 17, 18, 18,000, 18, 18, 18, 19. 20 on the phone. 20, 21. 23 grand, 23 on the right, 23, 24, 24, 25, 25, 25,000, 26, 26, 27, 27,000, 28, 28,000, 29, 29,000 in the hall, selling, 29 on my right, Gen 30, 30,000, 30,000, obviously knows it, wants it, 30,000, 31, 32, 32, 33, seat in there. 33,000, it's going, he's buying it. 33 and a half, 34, 34, 34, and I'm selling it. Gentleman in the hall, 34,000, does he want 34 and a half? B sharp, selling it, selling it, 30, 34 and a half, 34 and a half, maybe. 35, 35, he says, 35 and a half. 35, five, you sure? 35.5 on the phone. What do you think? 36. 36. 36. Are you done? You sure? 36. Well done, Chet. Well done, fella. Well done. 9865. 9865. The highest bid was from John and Samantha, now reunited with their love truck after 30 years. When it was sold from the family business, I think it went up north. I, I thought it went to Holland at one point, but I knew it definitely was in Ireland. And I thought, well, I can't see that coming up for sale ever. But when I saw this, I thought, yeah, got to have this back, I think. It's two months since Bruce bought the mighty Cobra replica. Quite a lively vehicle. It really does go well. I was quite impressed. But there's a problem. Beautiful it is. I, I do like it, but uh, there's just not a, uh, enough leg room for me to, to be comfortable in it. The plan to drop a big V8 engine into it has been shelved. Bruce has no regrets, though. Sometimes I just can't resist buying something. It would be nice to use it, but, uh, you know, if somebody comes along with the money, it's going. As for other sales in the auction, bidding was brisk for the Royal Enfield Constellation. 5,250, 55, 5,750, 5,750, 6,000, 6,000 pound, 250, 6,250. On the phone and keen to make the highest bid, a private buyer who Derek's known for years. I think he's got um, 114, I think. Uh, he does ride a little bit, actually, but I think he, he maybe limits it to his estate. One owner from you, Constellation, never be repeated. Seven thousand pound. Seven thousand. It's nice that the that the vendor knows that it's going somewhere where it's going to be cherished. The go karts went for two thousand two hundred pounds. Brilliant, love it. New owner Toby from Newcastle has Formula One ambitions for his daughter Ruby. Are you into go karting? No, nope, probably be on her. You got to start somewhere, sushi. So. A bit fun. Two bottles with the caps, with the product. You find them again, ever. 
The vintage engine oil that Perry brought along sold well. 130. Check them out, you'll find that that's cheap. As did the Rolls Royce radio. 22, back in here, front of you. 22, 22 pounds. 22, thank you. The comma tipper that arrived from Ireland was eventually sold for six thousand pounds, two and a half thousand under its original reserve. And after some negotiation, the mighty Atkinson was sold for eight and a half thousand pounds to a private collector in Staffordshire. The Volvo F88 has arrived at John and Samantha's haulage firm in Bedfordshire. Just really happy to have it back and grateful that we, we got to the auction and, and secured it. Employees have been amused by its arrival. It's become known as the love truck since the auction, so they're just waiting for the furry dice, uh, you know, throw back to the 80s. John and Sam, you know, sun visor strip. And drawing the curtains on a Saturday evening. <laughs> on <their bunk> <laughs> <laughs> the last time they climbed into this cab, they were both in their 20s. This is weird, isn't it? Oh God, how noisy it is inside the cab. You must have just shouted at one another. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not that nice memories of when we were younger and courting. And uh, uh, going out, uh, you know, on the old breakdown with John. Um, oh, no. Well, sometimes the dates got cancelled because you had to work. Uh, but it wasn't very long a time ago. <laughs> but it sounds good. And uh, so, yeah, we're really happy with it. We have been offered money for it since, um, but money won't buy it, not from me. If Samantha decides to knock me off on that, she can <laughs> decide what she wants to do with it after that, I think. But no, nah, yeah. I ain't going to sell it. <laughs>